الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد ذي القدر العظيم وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه إلى يوم الدين اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل وألهمنا رشدنا يا رب العالمين الحمد لله In our lessons on Imam Al-Birgivis Al-Tariqa Al-Muhammadiyya We've been looking at the essential virtues And after enumerating the virtues That are entailed by having taqwa of the heart In accordance with the way That the text was structured he, The author had shared with us some of the key encompassing virtues that hadn't been detailed earlier. Things like steadfastness, istiqama, being true, having spiritual insight, and the like. After that, the author said there's no harm in looking at the, the classification of the mutaqaddimin, of some of the earlier peoples, and this of course includes the classification of the Greek philosophers and others who broke down the virtues into certain essential traits from which all virtues arise. We're not on social media? Alhamdulillah. So as part of these essential virtues, we looked at the branch of wisdom, right? which is, you know, wisdom can be understood as being true knowledge. And what are the elements of true knowledge? Right? And these uh, are very beneficial in how one can be a person of sound judgment. And then we saw the 12 elements of courage, shaja'a, which are also, which is the second of the great encompassing virtues, right? Because you need to know things right, right? And that's wisdom. Right, that not only what is right, but also how to pursue it in the right manner, which is wisdom. But then courage is to be able to pursue what is true and right without any wrongful holding back. Without any wrongful holding back. And we looked at the elements of shaja'a, of courage as being 12. Today, we're going to start by looking at the third of the four essential virtues. And this is iffa, which can be translated in a verbose way as having dignified restraint, right? Because it is easy to pursue the truth without consideration that it's easy to pursue the truth without consideration right? but dignified restraint enables us to pursue the truth with courage yet with consideration right and that consideration that arises from dignified restraint that's that has many positive manifestations amongst them what the beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam described as mudara having tactful discretion right having tactful discretion 
having consideration, right? And he tells us, وَشُعَبُ الْعِفَّةِ إِثْنَةَ عَشْرَةَ The branches of عِفَّةَ of dignified restraint are 12. Right? The branches of dignified restraint are 12. Right? And this is meant here to be in a summary fashion, so he doesn't give us definitions of each of the essential virtues in detail, because they're understood from their implications. But ifa or afaf, right, is to hold oneself back from all that is unbecoming. It's to hold oneself back from all that is unbecoming. Right? And that's the right way of acting upon wisdom. Right? Because wisdom shows us things the way they are. Right? Courage gives us the capacity to pursue what is right without holding back out of fear or misgivings, internal or external. But then, dignified restraint is to uphold what is right in the right way. Right? So if someone came in, right, and, you know, they just came from the washroom and they didn't put on their pants. Um, so, now, it takes courage to tell them, by the way, you're not wearing pants, right? But dignified restraint is to know how to do it in an appropriate manner, right? Or if you're hungry during class, you need to eat. But in most places, eating a... Stuffed naan during class would not be di dignified. It would not be dignified. So this is key to upholding virtue, right? It is from the method of how one upholds wisdom and courage is afaf, which is to hold back from all that is unbecoming of one's own conduct or with, in the manner in which one conducts oneself with others. Right? That if you command the good, you do so with restraint. If you forbid the wrong, you do so with restraint. But very central to that is upholding restraint oneself. Why? That not acting in ways that are unbecoming by the standards of religion, reason, or custom. That's also riffa, right? To avoid acting in ways unbecoming by the standards of religion, reason, or sound custom. So he tells us that this quality of iffa, right, and it's a quality, of course, the Prophet وسلم, asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wa tuqa wa al-afafa wa al-ghina. Oh Allah, I ask you for all guidance, al-huda wa tuqa and for all Mindfulness, wal afaf, and all dignified restraint, wal ghina, and all freedom of need. So this quality has twelve aspects to it, by which, if they're found together, it is most fully upheld. He tells us, rahimahullah taala. That the, point, the first is al haya, its shyness. Wahia in hisaru nafs 
خوف ارتكاب القبائح right. the first of them is modesty right. this dignified restraint which beautifies the conduct of the believer the first of its qualities is haya modesty or shyness which is a holding back of the self out of fear of doing that which is vile right some people said that iffa and haya are almost synonymous a right? dignified restraint and modesty are almost synonymous or they're deeply interrelated right haya is a holding back of the self out of fear of doing that which is vile or considered bad again there are three standards to this religion reason and custom another way of breaking it down that the ulama mention there's haya from allah and there's haya from people right and haya from allah is always good right to feel shyness before allah is good if acted upon correctly right it if, if arising out of the right reason and if expressed in the right way right? because we feel shy before allah because of his great station right we have positive fear of allah not negative fear right but we have fear but we also have hope right we have awe but we also have love we have gratitude right so it is a positive fear that is so haya is a holding back with respect to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's positive generally if arising out of a sound attitude to the to, to the divine between hope and fear right with love with gratitude right um, and these other qualities not in an imbalanced way god is not out to get you um and expressed in accordance with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right so it's not a crippling shyness right now the fear from pe- the modesty with respect to people right a holding back of the self out of fear of doing that which people would consider vile or unbecoming could be for next worldly reasons and that's good right that as long as you do so sincerely for allah right so for example you're just going to go pray in your pajamas in the living room on the way down you realize oh my goodness my my, my brother is there and he sees me as his older brother and because you are his older brother but you say well, it's more pleasing to allah to dress properly for for fajr right so you go ch- change out of the pajamas or just put a moroccan cloak on or something right the shyness from people if it's safest when directed towards doing it out of the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right um, that you check your behavior due to sound consideration with respect to people and there the matter of intention comes in the safest way is to redirect one's intention when you feel shy for people that if it's a matter of the next life or a matter of the good that you intend to do it for the sake of allah otherwise it's a serious gray zone because you are acting for other than allah and when you feel shy with respect to people and there there are many nuances and it gets tricky we spent quite a bit of time looking at sincerity and it's uh, this 
shyness with respect to people has good elements because it keeps us civilized. It keeps us civilized. Were it not for society, most people would behave like savages. Um, so there's wisdom in that, in, in that shyness when it causes one to hold back from doing what is actually bad, wrong, right? Whether it's religiously prohibited or disliked, or that which is unbecoming by social standards, right? Such as making noise when one eats. In many societies, it's considered to be highly unbecoming. There's no specific uh, prophetic prohibition against making noises while you eat. Have you ever come across a hadith that whoever eats do not make noises? No, right? And there's wisdom in that because different societies have different standards of what is becoming and unbecoming. But there are certain social norms that are expressions of good conduct, of adab, right? of what is considered good. Right? So that's also fine that you hold yourself from un undignified behavior that just purely socially is not considered good. Such as making sounds while you're eating, such as picking your nose. Right? If you went to a, a society where people... You know, as long as they're not, not too close to you, they, they'll pick their nose visibly. It still wouldn't be becoming of a believer, but it's not necessarily bad. That if you're in a washroom making wudu, it is one of the adab that the scholars mention, right? To insert your left finger into your nostril. But would you do that in front of people? No, well, it, that depends on Consideration of people, right? Of not doing that which would be considered vile. You would not leave a deliberate sunnah because of people. But there are certain things that, you know, you, you hold back from that which would be considered unbecoming. So the scope <coughs> of consideration of people become being wrong Islamically right, with respect to modesty is when your sense of shyness before people causes you to leave what is obligatory or recommended before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or causes you to do, the, or consideration of people causes you to do what is prohibited or disliked. Because then shyness before people causes you to leave Shyness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's in that regards that our beloved Prophet sallallahu said, Allahu ahaqqu an yustaha minhu min nas Allah is more deserving of our shyness, of our sense of modesty than people are. Right? Than people are. So that's, that's haya. And haya, however, both in its Faith manifestation, right? Which is haya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also in a social manifestation of feeling a sense of wariness from doing that which people would consider unbecoming is a good quality. But we, but the the asl, the foundation is haya before Allah. Right? Haya from people is derivative from that and its scope is when shyness before people does not enter the sanctuary of shyness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so a believer would not leave a sunnah because of what people would say just simply because of what people would say there are situations where there's a balance of considerations and that's where wisdom comes in, where knowledge comes in. That what is superior? Eating on a table or eating on the ground? In accordance with the sunnah, in general. Eating on the ground. 
But let's say your uncle invited you to a, to a restaurant. Generally, people sit on tables in restaurants. But you decide to go to the middle of the restaurant and sit on the ground and say, please serve us here. Okay. So what? Why? Because I don't feel shy before people. I'm only shy before Allah. That sentiment may be good at the level of dignified restraint with God, but how does one balance that with consideration? Right? With consideration. That's what, why upholding dignified restraint requires wisdom. W wisdom. Right? And the sunnah is named wisdom, right? which is how to do what's right with due consideration. And in, in, in matters like that, they said that sunnahs of habit are upheld with consideration. Right? Are upheld with consideration of people and circumstances. Okay? And that's why they say that adab is taken from the people of adab. That when can, what, there are certain things one might not do. And there's other things that one does not let go of. Okay? So that's the first of the branches of Dignified restraint, haya. But the, the danger of haya is when one leaves what is religiously right because of consideration of people. And that is not positive shyness. That is leaving shyness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Junaid al-Baghdadi gave an amazing definition of haya, of true shyness. He said... That shyness is to consider the greatness of what you owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to consider how greatly you fall short in fulfilling the debt of gratitude to the divine. Between the two arises a quality called haya, called feeling shy or diffidence. Or modesty, haya. And the Prophet said, Al haya shu'batun min al iman. Shyness, modesty is a great branch of faith. Okay. The second of the branches of dignified restraint is sabr, right? is steadfastness, which he defines as habsun nafs an mutaba'atil hawa. Right? The dignified restraint, one of its branches, the second of its branches is sabr, is steadfastness, which is to hold the self back from following whim. Right? Patience or steadfastness is to hold one's self, one's lower self back from following whim. Whim are those inclinations that arise without consideration of benefit, whether worldly or next worldly. It's just, just because. Right? You're driving to the masjid and you pass by a place where they have really good uh, faluda. So you're like, let's get some faluda. Why? Just because. But you didn't consider benefit or harm, good or bad. What's better for you? Nothing. That's, if there's any consideration of benefit, then it is aql, it is reason. Right? If you judge your whim in accordance with reason, benefit and harm, good or bad, etc. If it's connected to consideration of the pleasure of Allah, or what is, you know, in accordance with the sunnah, that becomes qalb, that's heart. Even though it was originally whim. Right? That, you know, on the way to the masjid, you had a thought, let's get faluda. But, but then you thought about it, I'm going to miss the congregational prayer if I grab the faluda. So, okay, I'll grab some on the way back and I'll get it for my mother, my sister, and I'll drop some off at the neighbors. And then you think about it, that'll be expensive, I'll do it on the weekend. Right? And you decide to give 
$10 in charity instead. Or whichever way. When there's consideration of benefit and harm, that's heart, that's mind, that's qal, that's aql, that's reason. Right? When you consider the pleasure of Allah, it is heart. It's a heart-made decision, right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به None of you believes until their whims follow what I have come with. Means you still have whims. You have inclinations that just arise. You don't know from where. But to make your whims, which are by nature wayward, correspond to prophetic guidance, that is a sign of the perfection of faith. And it requires sabr, holding oneself to wisdom with courage and to avoid whim. Because the following of whim erodes one's dignity. It erodes iffa. Right? It's a sign of lacking dignified restraint. And this is um, the highest of jihad. Right? To hold oneself from following one's whim. And it is helped by the consideration of the, by reflection and remembrance of Allah. Because reflection and remembrance of Allah help make the next worldly consideration prevail over the worldly consideration. Right? To make, and to the extent that one can, that one's reflection and remembrance can stir the meanings of love, right? that the inclination towards Allah predominates over the one's inc inclination towards the fleeting. One of the great scholars was asked by a friend of mine, who's one of my teachers and mentors, though he's several years younger than me, but um, I always think of him as being five years older, even though he's actually three years younger. I, I said, you have an ERA, an effective respect age, that you're five years older than me, even though he's actually three years younger. Um, when he went to, to study in Damascus, his teacher gave him an amazing advice and the begins that be Abrahamic in your concern. For, Ab for Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam said, لا أحب الآفلين I love not things that perish. I don't... يعني, as the people of the spiritual path say, من تعلق بفانٍ ذل Whoever attaches themselves to the perishing abases themselves. Okay. So that requires steadfastness and dignified restraint. Because much of what we disgrace ourselves with religiously or in worldly terms are due to the following of, um, of whim. The next quality, the third of dignified restraint is a dia, right? Is 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 calm, is calm, right? It's calm, which is a sukoon in the hajan is shahwa. Right? It's a lowly calm, right? That you're able to remain still when desire overcomes one, whether it be sexual desire or whether it be um, the desire for. Food, whether it be de the desire to act negatively, da'a is a lowly stillness, right? Which is to be able to remain still when desire 
when lust, right, whether for one's physical desires, for food, or expressing negative emotion is stirred. The next quality of dignified restraint is a nazaha, is to keep to keep is to hold back, is holding back. And nazaha is to hold back, which is that in one iktisabu al-mal min ghayri mahanatin wala zulm. Holding back, which is to earn one's livelihood without humiliating oneself nor by wronging anyone. Humiliating oneself that you have a dignity as a believer. So religiously humiliating yourself, you got a really got good job offer, but they're not going to let you pray on time. Or they'll only give you a minimum amount of time. You had a choice to take various jobs. Okay? But nazaha, having the... You know, holding back, right? It's from dignified restraint that you could have, you, you, you could make, you know, several thousand a year more and that work, but there's other work available. So you humiliate yourself in religious terms or in other, in other terms, right? That... You know, you're, you're working for a company that is Islamophobic. You're working for a company that is racist, whatever. So in worldly terms, this is unbecoming. Or you're working in, in an area where there's wrongdoing to people. I'm talking to someone who's working for one of the big tech giants in a very questionable field of research. You say, I know it's, pro- it's, it's really shady when it's a, yeah, haram. Uh, but it pays the bills. And it's good experience. And keda, and keda. Right? That's not dignifying oneself, right? So, nazaha is to hold back, right? Hold back in how one earns a living. The Prophet ﷺ said that, Ajmilu fi talab. Seek your earnings in a, with, Beautiful restraint. Ijmal, to, to know how and when to hold back. Right? How and when to hold back. Right? So you don't wrong yourself. You don't abase yourself. And you, you don't wrong yourself. Right? And you don't wrong others in your line, in, in the way that you earn a living. وَإِنْفَاقُهُ فِي, فِي الْمَصَارِفِ الْحَمِيدَةِ And from holding back is to spend one's money in ways that are praiseworthy, not in ways that are blameworthy. Okay, to spend it in ways that are praiseworthy, not in ways that are blameworthy. That's from holding back, right? وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌ مَعْلُومٌ and in their wealth, there is a known right. right? For, the, for the one asking and the one without. Right? And the haqqun ma'loom, one is that it, in their wealth is a known right. One is the easier interpretation given by the early Muslims is that is that zakat. But also, There is a recommended right and a collective obligation to support all worthy causes. Because every worthy cause that is connected with fundamental human interests or prevention of fundamental human harms is a fard kifaya, is a collective obligation. It's personally recommended. But collectively, it's a collective duty. Now, you can't fulfill all collective duties, but what are you doing about any any of the ones that are facilitated for you. So that's part of holding back from frivolous spending. Right? That by spending frivolously, for example, one is 
falling short of fulfilling some of the spending above and beyond the minimum that's recommended for you. And that's from dignified restraint. So you, you may have a lot of wealth, but are you, you know, where is the right of the poor and the needy and the worthy causes, religious and worldly, in it? Related to dignified restraint is, one of its branches is al-qana'ah, is contentment. Which is, وَهُوَ الْإِقْتِصَارُ عَلَى الْكَفَافِ Contentment, which is to limit oneself to what is sufficient. And that applies to everything. Right? They say that contentment is one of the qualities that is praiseworthy in the worldly Qana'ah is to find sufficiency. It's enough. That it's one of the qualities that possessing it is praiseworthy in the worldly, but blameworthy in the religious. You should not feel content about the state of your worship. Right? Content in the sense that I've done enough. You should not feel qana'ah. You not feel a sense of sufficiency with respect to your knowledge. Do not feel a sense of, of I've done enough with respect to your service. Right? Because these are abwabul akhirah, the doors of the hereafter. Allah deserves more with respect to the debt of gratitude. But the worldly, right, the worldly, the prophetic way, what we've been called to is expressed beautifully in the dua of the Prophet. Allahumma ja'al. رِزْقَ آلِ مُحَمَّدٍ kafafa. O oh Allah, make the provision of the folk of Muhammad sufficiency. Sufficiency. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about how we approach this life. وَابْتَغِي فِي مَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ Seek with all that Allah has given you the next abode. We should be maximalists when it comes to the next life. وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا And yet do not forget your share of this life. Right? So contentment that you find sufficiency. So many things people fall into the blameworthy regarding because they overdo dunya. We have to, and they come up with some imagined notions of what we have to do. We have to take that vacation in that far off place, we have to upgrade our car, we have to do this, we have to do that. And none of it do you have to do. Right? So contentment comes from wisdom and courage. Right? Because you know what is right and what is worth it. Right? Contentment, right? or contentment in the sense of qana'ah, of finding sufficiency. Arises from knowing the divine promise. And the next life is better for you. Is absolutely better for you than this life. And part of contentment comes from reason. That sound judgment entails knowing that there's three types of things that you incline towards. There's darura, haja, and tahseen. There's necessities, needs, and wishes. And the psychology of influence around you tries to turn your, your manufactured wishes into necessities. I must such and such. You have to try that new coffee. No, you don't. Right? And we should we need to change our vocabulary, right? So I must no. Right? There's necessity, there's need, and there's wants. Right? The necessary is only what Allah has made necessary. Right? The need is that which fulfills the fundamental good of this life or the next for you. The recognized good of this life. You need Somewhere to, to sleep. 
you need to be able to eat and drink, right? You need basic clothing to cover yourself. You need work, right? But you don't need that smoked Wagyu brisket, right? You want it, right? You want it. And we prioritize in that way. And dignified restraint entails foregoing one's mere wishes unless they connect with good intentions. And there are many good intentions. I want to visit the park. Well, you take your family. You do other. You put good intentions behind it and it rises up from being a mere whim to having a good meaning behind it. So that's contentment. Right? And so much harm arises from people humiliating themselves by religious standards, by, by the mere following of their, their unchecked desires. The next branch of dignified restraint is waqar. Waqar, which can be translated as serenity, or just as dignity. Waqara al ma, right? Waqar has to do with praiseworthy stillness, right? If water in, in a pool is still, you say waqara al ma, right? Right? The water was still. It's a dignified, beautified stillness. Okay? It, it, that's why it can easily be translated as dignity. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu said, عَلَيْكُمْ بِالسَّكِينَةِ وَالْوَقَارِ Hold fast to serenity and dignified stillness. Right? It's come in general and it's come also that إِذَا أُقِيمَتِ الصَّلَىٰ If the prayer has begun, فَمْشُوا إِلَيْهَا بِالسَّكِينَةِ وَالْوَقَارِ Then walk to it with serenity and with dignified calm. Whatever of it you caught, you've caught. And whatever of it you have missed, make it up. Right? And that's this dignified, you know, so waqar is this dignified stillness. Right? And he defines waqar as at-ta'anni fi tawajjuh nahwa al-matalib. This dignified stillness or dignified calm is to be circumspect. Right? To be circumspect, to be unrushed in directing oneself towards one's aims. Right? So, you know, you, you need to get to the masjid. So you park your car in the in the masjid parking lot and you cut across bump into several people, the old uncle, he's about to slowly open the door, you open the door from above his head, go in, slam the door on uncle, right? Why? Because I want to catch the first row. Now, that's a good aim, but this is not how you pursue it. Right? So this dignified calm is being circumspect. Ta'anni, which is being unrushed, thinking things through, right? when directing oneself towards one's aspirations. Because sometimes something's worth pursuing. So, you go ahead. But there's a dignified, calm, thought-out way of pursuing it. That's why the ulama would discourage, in places like Damascus, for example, that if you're a student of knowledge, if you're a person of of religious concern, that even if you're running late, you don't run behind a bus. You rush, but there's a dignified calm that you uphold even in those circumstances. Right? right? Even if you're going to go throw out the garbage, right? You don't go out in your pajamas, right? You put on something dignified. Yes, 
It's a sound aim. I'm just throwing out my garbage. But there's a dignifying. This is for where if arises, right? And this, and sometimes it's manifest in small things. But if the small things are taken care of, those are training grounds for the big things. From rifa, from dignified restraint, is also a rifq, gentleness, right? Right? Which is husnul inqiyad bima yuaddi ila al jamil. A gentleness which is to have a good submissiveness to, to all that will lead to good conduct, to beautiful conduct. Rifq, gentleness, is to have a, a, a good submissiveness, a willingness to let go in ways that will lead to beautiful conduct. And it's tough. Right? It's tough. From dignified restraint also is husnu samt, right? Is is to have a beautiful comportment. Wahua mahabba tu ma yukmilu nafs. To have a good comportment, right? Husnu samt. There's an outward form to it, a good outward comportment, and a good inward component, which is to love that which would complete oneself inwardly. Right? That you uphold good qualities of character. Why? Because you like, you, you know who you are. I'm a servant of God. So I, up, I uphold good traits of character. Such as what? Having, good, you know, having a good opinion of someone. Greeting them first. Courtesy, etc. So there's a good comportment. A husn semt. Right, a good appearance of one's character and conduct. But also, a good comportment relates to even one's physical appearance. Why? Because you know who you are. You're, you're an honored servant of Allah. Right? So you dress in a dignified manner. Right? You deal with people in a dignified manner. Right? So having a good comportment. And just takes that little bit of effort, right? That it's your friend's wedding and you didn't want to show up, but just you have to. Now you have iron clothes already hanging. It just takes that moment's concern to cha- you know, change from the shirt that you know you spilled your lunch over, but put on something more dignified. Why? Because you like that which is becoming, right? Right? That's becoming. But it's not done out of mere consideration of people. This is a religious virtue when done, seeking the pleasure of Allah. In Allah Jamil Yuhibbul Jamal. Truly Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. From dignified restraint also is Al Wara, scrupulousness. Right? Scrupulousness. And he defines it, وَهُوَ مُلَازَمَةُ الْأَعْمَالِ الْجَلِيلَةِ Which is to hold oneself to great actions. What are scrupulousness? To be, to be careful to do the right thing in the right way. Right? Scrupulousness, which is like caution. Right? Caution, but it's to be careful to do the right thing in the right way. Okay? It's not necessarily to be more strict, although very often it is. That when you're unsure, you hold back. If something is differed upon, and you know it's differed upon, even though it may be allowed, you hold back because you want to be careful to do the right thing in the right way. And that's and that requires. Mujahada, that requires striving. It requires sacrifice. Okay. You really liked, you read some reviews about this place that does the most amazing chicken sandwiches, but you found out that they, 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 it's machine slaughtered. So scrupulousness entails that, okay, yes, there's difference of opinion about it, but certainly the str- 
more precautionary opinion is not to have machine slaughtered zabiha meat. So you don't. Okay. Or other matters where there's where there's different where there's strong difference of opinion about. Okay. Um, I have a I have a teacher and mentor who researched a particular ingredient league and came to the conclusion that it's that it's permissible. I was surprised at his conclusion. I said, so who do you have it? I'd never touch it. So, but he just wrote a whole treatise that it's permissible. So, yeah, it's legally permissible, but one doesn't do what's legally permissible. One tries to do what's better. And that's scrupulousness. And that's an operational aspect of that is to leave what is disliked, to leave that w which there is difference of opinion about, okay? and to leave that which is unbecoming. Right? Also, from caution, there's a spiritual scrupulousness, which is to be careful to leave the things that you find busy, busy your heart and your consciousness from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And then there is al-muru'a, right? Muru'a, which is manliness, right? Or dignified strength, right? Which is al-raghbatu sadiqa lin-nafs fi al-ifada bi qadri ma yumkin, right? Manliness or dignified strength, which is a true avidness in the self to benefit others to the extent possible. That's what manliness is. Manliness is not brutal strength, right? But dignified strength, right? Is a true avidness in the self to benefit others to the extent possible. That's what it means to be a man, right? Okay. That you're driving home, someone's car's broken down. You know all about all about cars and stuff. You're like, oh, I get got to get to dinner. So no, you you stop the car, help them out, right? So, oh, but what if they beat me up? Yeah, you know, like the nafs likes chattering, all kinds of stuff. No, but manliness is to take that extra step. Because why? Because you have a sincere avidness to be a benefit to others to the extent possible. And then the next one, al-intidham, is to be organized. Is to be organized. وَهُوَ تَقْدِيرُ الْأُمُورِ وَتَرْتِيبُهَا بِحَسَبِ الْمَصَالِحِ to be organized. Part of dig dignified restraint is to plan things out and arrange them in ways that fulfill recognized benefits. Right? To be organized with respect to one's time, one's money, one's attention, one's possessions. To plan things and organize them in ways that fulfill benefits. Okay. the believer should be very careful about their time and how it is spent, about their attention and where it is directed, about their life and what are its priorities, right? but also one's own affairs. Right? That what do you give priority to? والسخاء 
and generosity of spirit. Right? Generosity. Right? Sakha to be expansive, literally. Right? And generosity is to give what is befitting to those it is befitting for. Right? And this generosity itself has six qualities underneath it. And so generosity itself has six qualities underneath it. Right? Sakha. Sakhi is the one who's giving, right? The first is, so there's six elements of being giving, right? Being expansively giving. The first is, al karam, right? Al i'ata bi suhula wa tib al nafs. Al karam, right? which is generosity, which is to give with ease and in good spirit. You don't feel bad, or, you know, like you gave it. And you're like, oh, you know, I could have really used that, right? That's karam, right? And Arabs use the same word for generosity and for nobility. That's why we call Quran al-Kareem, the noble Quran. Because no, for Arabs, a noble person is one who is giving to others. Right? But giving with ease and in good spirit. Right? The Arabs were, of the desert were famous. If guests came to them, they only had one camel. And they depended on the camel for their livelihood. They slaughtered the camel for strangers. Even if they risk ruin in the desert. But of course the sunnah has taught us right balance with things. But karam, and the opposite of karam is shuh, is stinginess. And they say it was aqbahu al-qabih, like the most vile of vile things, is someone who's stingy. Okay? From, gener- from this giving spirit, we have generosity. The second of six elements of being giving is al ithar right? Which is preferring others to oneself. An yakuna ma mal kaf an hajatihi, right? Right? Preferring others to oneself, which is that you give willingly and in good spirit, even if you have to hold back on your own need. So you wanted to get a fan for your room. It's kind of hot and the, the cooling's not working that well, etc. So you got a fan, but you realize that, that your sister also needs a fan. I don't know that. So ethod is preferring to others, preferring others to oneself, even when one has need for the, the matter. Right? And this is the the quality of the ansar. And they prefer others to themselves even if they have strong need themselves. Right? When the when the Meccans, the Muhajireen came, when the Meccans came as migrants to Medina, the people of Medina had been through a very tough time. They'd just been fighting between themselves. And there are many reasons why the economy was in very difficult circumstances in Medina. But yet, the Ansar, the people of Medina, preferred the, muha- the, the Muhajireen. يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ They loved those who migrated to them. And they found nothing within their hearts with respect to what they spent on them. That is ithar. So the elements of having a giving spirit are firstly, generosity. Secondly, preferring others to oneself. Third, a nail. And to prefer others one, uh, to, uh, to oneself while f- 
while doing so happily, while doing so happily. The fourth is wal muasa, right? Right? Is to be expansive in it. An yakuna ma musharakatil asdiqa, right? To do it in a shared way by make, having one's friends participate. Right? Why? Because the needs of others are vast. You can't just do it on your own. Right? Sometimes someone will give generously, but they don't want their friends and neighbors and or family to know that those people are in need or in difficulty. Right? But part of having a giving spirit is to be willing to, to annoy friends and family, etc. For them to participate as well in giving. Right? Because you might be an elder cousin or an elder sibling or respected in your circles. Right? And as we know from Surah Ma'un, from the completion of one's faith is not only to give those in need, but to encourage others to assist in good causes. Right? And that's al muasa Nikuna Musharakat al Asdiqa. Right? Because there one did not just help and prefer others to oneself, but one took the extra step of encouraging others to participate. And with that, a fifth quality of having a giving spirit, as samaha, right, is to be easy, right? Badl mala yajib tafadula, which is to to give of what is not required out of uh, as a favor, right? To be easy, to give of what's not required as a favor, and that this. Um, You know, your your neighbors travel to Turkey, but their son is this university student. You know, you said you'd help out, etc. Last month, he overspent on religious books, so he didn't have enough to pay the rent. So you helped out with the rent. Now this month, same thing happened. Right? As Sema had to be easy. You, know, you do it again. Right? You spent. It wasn't needed for you to spend. But as a favor, and you gradually help them rebalance. From Samaha to be easygoing also is to spend of your rights by foregoing them when it's not required. Someone said they'd repay you. You know, Zubair got married, you know, he borrowed 10,000 for his mahar. He said he'd pay you back in 10 months. Month 10 comes. He just bought an inventory of rare Chinese teas to start a business. Now, can you demand your right? Month 10? Yeah. But part of having a giving spirit? You say, okay, sure. I'll give you an extra month, two, three, as much as you're able, even though you don't want to. Why? Out of having samaha, right? Um, a a generous spirit. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I've been sent with the upright, easy way. An easy going, an easy way. Right? And related to that, the sixth quality of being giving is Al Musamaha, is to be forgiving. Tarku Mala Yajib. Tanazuhan is to leave that which you don't have to leave out of, you know, out of dignifying oneself from it. Right? Zubair borrowed $10,000 to pay his mahar. He spent it on rare Chinese teas. And then he didn't check on humidity levels in the storage house. They're all spoiled. Now, three months after the time you gave, you can still demand your money. You could take him to court. You could do whatever. But you waive it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It's to leave that which is not required to leave out of tanazzuh. You don't want to get embroiled in things like that. 
And that's, you know, there's, it's not, none of this is required. Being giving is, all you're required to give is the, the obligatory right before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is obligatory for others. And, but beyond that, these six qualities, which are the six qualities of having a giving spirit, which are generosity, al-karam. Secondly, preferring others to oneself. Thirdly, to prefer them with happiness. Number four, involving others in one's giving. The fifth is to overlook. Right? Overlook, right? not to demand what is due to you when it's demanded, but to give more time. And sixth is to forgive, right? to forgive. So, okay, I know you're having a tough time. You don't have to repay, to waive a debt. Right? There's great merit in that. So these are 12 elements of dignified restraint. And one of the most beautif beautifying qualities of dignified restraint of is sakha, right? Is gen be being giving in, in spirit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us these virtues. Next class, we're going to look at the 14 elements of justice, right? Of justice or right balance in life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we be of the people of right balance. So we're going to take that and then there's a closing counsel of Imam um, Al-Khadimi related to paying attention to, to the heart, after which we'll look at the next section, which is on the blameworthy traits of the tongue. So we're going to look at justice and then a counsel for, you need, for the seeker to pay attention to their heart and their state, after which we'll be moving on ta'ala to the section on guarding the tongue wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam um there is there's a few questions um okay so there's a question that can you eat non halal beef or chicken goat lamb etc when traveling in an area um, where um, they, they, presumably um, there isn't the availability of uh, ritually slaughtered meat um, the believer should plan right and that's part of being organized right Eating meat is not an, a religious duty, right? Um, and in most places, most urban areas, um, you can access meat or fish or one can take frozen goods with one, right? Um, or take dr dry f dried foods. There's many ways one can have, um, you know, sometimes months would pass and not... There'd be no cooked food in the house of the Prophet, in any of the houses of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Let's say the Aisha relates, sometimes entire, you know, several months would pass and no fire was lit to cook a meal in the house, any of the houses of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the command, and we have many resources on seekers about this, the command to only eat that which has been Ritually slaughtered. لا تأكل مما لم يذكر اسم الله عليه. Do not eat that which the name of Allah was not pronounced, the name of God was not pronounced at the time of slaughtering. وإنه لفسق. In, indeed, doing so is corrupt indeed, right? Because life has a sanctity, and that's why the taking of a life is a ritual act. It is only permissible with certain conditions, right? And the meat of the people of the book is permitted if they slaughter ritually, right? If they slaughter ritually, safeguarding 
the limits of the Abrahamic slaughter that Allah Most High has defined. In other cases, one, one plans, and that's one of the great expressions of having dignified restraint, that one's going to a place where there isn't ready, ready availability of halal meat. There are, there, are, there are different online companies that ship frozen meats. So you can get a shipment of meat to wherever you're traveling, for example, or fi found, find out. Right? Most towns and cities in North America, for example, have Muslim populations. Sometimes they're tucked away here and there, but one can get halal meat, um, fish is an easy option, vegetables. There's a lot of people who hardly ever eat meat. Um, so there are many options related to that. Um, Um, right. Inshallah, may, may Allah subhanahu wa taala uh, ease, assist, and facilitate. We have many answers and seekers about why we only eat ritually slaughtered meat, um, and what to do if one's in in a place where those aren't readily available. Um, 